of encouragement after Brother Shouts of Lesson will be hymn number two. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see you here tonight. We're going to ring out that message right here, right now. We need our Bibles open to the book of Psalm 19, please. Psalm 19 in our Bibles is where we're going to begin our lesson tonight. Thank you so much for being here. To all of our guests who are visiting here tonight, we're delighted to have you. Thank you for coming our way and helping us praise the God who's worthy of all of our admiration. We're thankful for you being here. This good church, how was your Tuesday? Did you have a good day today? It's a lot you can do on a Tuesday. I'll tell you this, and I'm not complaining. I'm joyful. It's just cold. I thought it was cold when I lived in Tennessee the last time I came here, and then in Texas when we're used to 100 degrees and it's 50 here. I didn't bring my winter coat. I wasn't ready for this, uh, for this weather. So it's been a wonderful day. It's been a blessed day. And I hope whatever it was that you did today and all the places that your, your day took you, I hope you had a good day. But we're thankful you're here tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about the home, the advantage of a godly home. Tonight we're going to have something for everyone. I, I'm not sure what your home d dynamic may look like, whether if you are married or single, if you are a parent or a grandparent, we're going to have something here tonight for everyone. Kind of like the sign at a, at a ranch that said there are horses for everyone, fast ho people, fast horses, slow people, slow horses, people that have never ridden a horse before, horses that have never been ridden before. We, we've, got, we've got something here tonight for everyone. If you don't get that, you, don't, you haven't ridden a horse before, so <laughs> we're going to talk about the home. There's a, a phrase that's used in sports. I've heard it the most in basketball, and maybe that's because I'm, I'm from, from a Hoosier land, and I'm, I'm so glad to be here because when I use basketball analogies in Texas, they just go flat because all they talk about is the pointy ball. I, you all understand a round ball with me. You know basketball. There's a phrase we used, and it's called the home court advantage, or maybe the home field advantage for football. It's a principle that when, when a team plays at home, they have a leg up on the visiting team because that's their turf. That's their ground. That's their court. They, they, they know it. They know the feel of the wood. They know the give and take of the basket. They know the environment. And, and most times, it's, you're going to have your fans there, your home crowd there to cheer you on. And so the team that plays at home has an advantage over the visiting team. Tonight, we're talking about how the godly home, the home that honors the Lord, is of great advantage to the life of the children in that home of those parents and of those grandparents. That's something that's taught in the book of Proverbs 20, verse 7. Notice the verse, the, the righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. The man who is walking in the way he ought to walk, his children are going to be blessed for that. If you look at Proverbs 14, verse 26, in the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence and his children will have a refuge. That's not the Lord's children, it's the man who fears the Lord. His children are going to have a refuge. I like the NIV's rendering of that. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. There's a blessing. There's a grand advantage we can give our kids and our grandkids when they are raised in a good, strong, godly home. I mean, think of it. Home is where it starts. The first place we learn about God, the first place we learn about the Bible, the first place we learn about, about the church where we learn how to worship, where we learn about integrity and honesty and character and those inner values, that, that all starts at home. And so the, the people, God's people who want to give our children the best chance possible of walking with Jesus, of making it home to that reward that we sang about, it's going to be found in a godly home and a home that is built upon God and his words. But we need to put a couple caveats on here. If this is going to be successful, if the home is going to be advantaged, number one, it's got to be built God's way. The only way that the home is going to be a blessing to those children, the only way it's going to be an advantage is when the home is built God's way. The psalmist says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Because without a doubt, there are some who choose to build their homes on, in, on, on any number of things. We're going to build our homes on finance. We're going to build our homes on society. We're going to build our home on sports. When you build your home on anything but the Lord, inevitably that home will crumble. And so if I want my home to be a blessing to my children, I've got to build it God's way. God's way works every time. And so I need to make sure I'm building it by God's word. Here's the other caveat, though. Because you may be here tonight, and maybe you didn't have a good home. Maybe you didn't have a godly home. Maybe you didn't have good parenting. 
Maybe mom and dad were not there, or maybe if they were there, they weren't the parents that, that they should have been, and yet you're here, and yet you believe in Jesus, and yet you're walking that walk. Children can rise above their upbringing. Even though you weren't given the great example, even though you weren't started on that right path, you chose a different direction for your life. I mean, we think of King Josiah, a wicked father, a wicked grandfather, and yet he sought the Lord in his youth. And so even though your home might not have started out the way that it should have, you can change from your path and choose a different direction in your life. The direction we're looking at tonight, the point of our lesson this evening is if we want to give our children the best chance possible of walking close with Jesus, of making it home, it starts in our homes. It all starts at home, brethren. The place where we learn about God, the place where we set the course for the direction of their life, it starts at home. So we're going to look at the attributes of a godly home, a home that will give the children the best chance possible, that great advantage spiritually. Here's one attribute. This home is one where God's word is seen as a boundary and a compass. A home is a boundary and a compass. I want you to imagine it with me. God's word is seen as a boundary. Boundaries keep you where, you're, where you belong. They determine what is acceptable from what is unacceptable. Imagine with me the game of football. Can you imagine taking away all the lines, all the boundaries, no end zones, no out of bounds? Can you imagine what that game would look like? Kind of look like rugby, wouldn't it? <laughs> it kind of looked like toddlers playing football. They're all over the place. It'd be everywhere because without the boundaries, you don't have the game. Can you imagine going out tonight and we take away all the boundaries on the road? No lines telling you where your lane is. No signs telling you where you can go and where you shouldn't go. No traffic stops. No guardrails over those steep curves. Can you imagine? See, boundaries are designed to tell you what is, what is safe and what is unsafe, what's acceptable and unacceptable. They're designed to keep you where you belong. And God's word is a boundary. God's word has a lot to say. Haven't we seen that already this week, good brethren? <laughs> we started on Sunday. God's word has something to say about your job and where you work. It has something to say about your money and how you make that money and what you do with that money. It has something to say about your language and your habits and your relationships, your friends and your marriage and your kids. God's word has something to say about your life and your body, what you put in your body, on your body, what you do with your body. God's word has a lot to say about life under the sun. There are some people who say, that's just a little too much too much there's already too many rules as there are and that's just too constraining you can't tell me how to live my life well you are free tonight to drive wherever it is you want to drive you don't have to pay attention to the lines you don't have to pay attention to the signs you don't have to pay attention to the traffic lights you can drive as fast as you want not paying attention to those guardrails you can go wherever it is you want to go but it comes with a cost Sometimes it might cost you a car, it might cost you a night in jail with Larry. <laughs> it might cost you your life. And from God's perspective, as we're looking at this analogy, it could cost you your soul. Sometimes we say it and we mean it well, you have to learn things the hard way. If they're going to learn it, they've got to learn it the hard way. They have to experience it themselves. That's not the way that God teaches us. God doesn't believe that you have to learn things the hard way. His word is designed that you don't have to face that. You don't have to face that sin to face those consequences to learn that some things are just bad for you. Notice this in the book of Psalm 19. Just listen to what, to what the psalmist here describes, the law of God, the boundaries of God's word. This is David here writing in Psalm 19, beginning of verse 7. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord, they are true. They are, they're righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yea, much than fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. See what he's saying here? What you have in your hands in those words is more, more valuable than any treasure you will ever possess in this life. This is truth. This is real wisdom. This is real guidance in your life. And did you notice that last verse down there? That verse down there in verse 11. By these you are not only blessed, by these you are warned. And so when thinking, I just have to see it for myself. I just have to learn by myself. That's not what God says. Learn ahead of time. 
There's some paths in life you shouldn't take. There's some dis decisions and choices in your life you should not make because I'm warning you there's a path, there's a decision, there's a, there's a way in life. It's only going to bring you harm. And so in the godly home, God's word is seen as it was intended to be a boundary. I'm trying to keep you where you belong. Maybe that's why God, through Moses, made it clear in the law, I want you as not as priests, not as Moses, the great preacher and spokesman. No, I want you as moms and dads to make sure this word is taught in the home. These words, he says, these words which I'm commanding to you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk of them when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them on a, as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Do you see what he's saying here? It's something implied. If God's word is going to be seen as a boundary, then that home is going to be reading and understanding God's word. They're going to be making the word of God part of everyday living. And folding the word and the truth of God in our everyday living. You know what this looks like? Just a glimpse. You're walking along the way with your kids, and they see a bird in its nest. And they say, look at that, it's a bird, because kids love animals. And you say, guess who made that bird? Who taught that bird how to sing? Who gave the bird that color in its wings? That was your maker and mine. Or on nights like these, I love the spring nights. You go outside, maybe not tonight because it's cloudy, but you look up and you, you show your children the stars. And you tell them, you know what? Thousands of years ago, God talked to a man and he pointed them up to that same sky, those same stars, that same moon. And he said, one day you're going to have more descendants and you can count in the stars in the sky. And guess what? Thanks to Jesus, we're part of that family too. Or maybe it's just as simple as, good morning, beautiful. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. I held a gospel meeting in Alabama once with an, and I stayed with an elderly couple and they started every day singing that song. I didn't know that. I didn't know they wanted me to sing along too. <laughs> and I didn't know they sang it in the round because they started, this is the day, this is the day. And they stopped and looked at me. <laughs> like, I haven't even had my cup of coffee yet. All right, that the Lord has made. <laughs> I will rejoice. <laughs> you know what, by Friday, I love that. I love that. You know why? Because there at the beginning of a day, whatever that day was to become, my mind was reoriented, refocused on what really mattered. God gave me this day, and you know what? I'm going to rejoice, and I'm going to be glad. That's what we're talking about, taking the word of God and bringing it into everyday living. And what God would say later on in this context is that the reason he gives us these boundaries and the reason he gives us these laws, the reason he gives us these commands, it's not to make your life tough. I just want to see him squirm. I want to make life real hard for him. Look what he says. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival. You see that? When I follow these words as he wrote them, I will be the best version of me that I can be. I will be the best husband when I'm a husband by the book or best wife when I'm a wife of the book. I will be the best dad that I could possibly be when I'm a father by the book, when my parenting is by the book. I'll be the best citizen of this country, and more importantly, I'll be the best citizen of, of the heavenly country when I live by the book. It's for our good and for our survival. God's word is seen as a boundary to keep us where we belong. But God's word is also a compass. You know what a compass is? A compass is designed to show you where you are in relation to where it is you want to go. And so I'm here, and I know I need to head east. And so I look at the compass, and I see where I am, and it helps me see where I'm going in relation to where it is I need to be. Here's what that means for the godly home. Not only are we, are we reading the Bible and teaching the Bible and, and understanding the Bible, using it as a boundary, we're also looking to God's word to determine my direction in life. God's word determines some great, powerful truths for my home. And so, when it comes to my purpose, why am I here? Why am I on earth? God's word determines that. I'm not a cosmic mistake. My kids are not some kind of an evolutionary mistake. From the goo to the zoo to you. No, God fashioned and formed me, Psalm 139, in my mother's womb. He wove me together. 
which means everything about you, the color of your eyes and the color of your hair and how tall or short you are, your talents and your abilities, that's God-made, God-given. God's word determines my purpose here. You know that's also true of value. And if you've got teenagers in your home, this is where you're camped out right now. You know, you may not make the best grades. You may not make the team. You may not make the cut. You may not make the choir. You may not have the nicest things, the nicest clothes. You may not have an iPhone or the newest phone. You may not have a car. You may not have a lot of friends. Or even come to us today because we do this all the time, brethren. We may not have a lot of money. We may not have a big house, a nice house. We may not have a great job. We may not even right now have a job. And yet, you know what? Without any of those things, I still mean everything to God. That doesn't determine my value. In your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. I want you to read with me in your Bibles. 1 Peter chapter 1. It's the amazing thing that Sundays we get this. We stand at this table and we eat the bread and we drink the cup. And for a moment, for a moment, we said, yes, I'm loved and I'm valued. He gave his life for me. I ate that and I drank that and I know that. But then Monday comes and oh, we're reaching and we're grabbing. I just want to feel worthwhile. I want to feel important. I want to feel loved. If I just had more money, if I had a newer car, if I had a better job. Will you listen here? First Peter chapter 1. Look what he says in verse 17. He said, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold for your future, from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood, the blood of Christ. Brethren, get your eyes on verse 18 and put yours there. Because look what he's saying. You mean more than gold and silver to God. You mean more than your job to God. You mean more than your wealth to God. You mean more than your marital status to God. You mean more than how many friends you have to God. You mean more than everything to God because he gave the greatest thing that exists for you. You. And so in my home, in the godly home, God's word not only determines our boundaries, where we go, it determines our direction. The answer to the questions we ask in this life. Maybe the proverb writer sums it up best when he says, By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it's established. And by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Do you see that? The house is built, the house is formed, the house is furnished with the knowledge, the knowledge of God. Can I tell you something, parents? The place your kids learn about God is not for the schools. That's not where they're supposed to learn about God. It's not the school's responsibility. And the place for your kids to learn about God, it's not the responsibility of this church. This church will help. But the responsibility is on us. The primary place of learning, of learning truth, is at home. Is at home. Our kids have a lot of questions. My kids' questions these days are why? Why, 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 why? But as they get older, the bigger the questions get. How do we know? How do we know that really is God's word? I mean, how do you really know? Because there's some friends who say it's full of error. How do you know? I mean, how do you know that the way we worship in this church, that's the right way? Because I have friends and they worship differently. I mean, there's some who have bands up here. There's some who have women who are preaching. How do you know? How do you know that's the right way? And you know what? Those are great things. We learn by asking questions. But here's the thing. While we cannot determine what questions our kids have, we can determine who their teacher will be. Will it be their friends? Will it be the media or social media? Or will it be mom and dad through the word of God? The home that gives children the best chance possible of walking with Jesus, of making it home, is a home where God's word is a boundary and a compass. We are teaching God's word in this home every day, making it a part of our kids' lives, of our lives. Here's another one. The home is a place where service is expected and praised because the kingdom principle is this. 
That greatness in Christ's kingdom is not by stepping on the backs of others and saying, hey, look at me. Greatness in Christ's kingdom, he says, it's not among you, but whoever wishes to become great shall become or be your servant. It's service. And so if you want to be great in Christ's kingdom, you have to learn to develop the heart of, of service. You know what this looks like? It begins with mom and dad. Mom and dad who are modeling service for kids. And so mom and dad serve each other. And mom and dad serve the home. They serve kids and they serve each other and whatever needs are possible. And they're not nagged. They're not bothered. So listen, take out the trash. Can you take out the trash, please? Can you take out the trash? I asked you on Tuesday, can you take out the trash? Hey, the trash is with several piles by the door. Can you take out the trash? You're not nagged. Come on, serve and do your work, whatever it may be. You're modeling service in the home. And then it's a service that extends outside the home. It's a service that comes to the family of Christ. Not only are kids seeing mom and dad serve in their family, they're seeing them serve the family of the brethren. So when someone is in need, mom and dad are writing cards. Or mom and dad are making meals and preparing meals. Or mom and dad are going to help some of the, the elder members with, with whatever needs they have. And it's a service that goes outside their doors to their neighbors. They're, they're, they're uh, plowing the snow, shoveling, I was thinking of shoveling, shoveling the snow, we don't have snow in Texas, shoveling the snow, they're raking the leaves, they're baking goods for their neighbors, they're modeling service for their kids, because here's why, we cannot expect our kids to do what they don't see in us, we can't expect it, and so if I want my kids to have a heart of service, I have to be a servant, but that's one thing we need to expect, in fact, it starts early on. If mom and dad are going to serve, because in Christ's kingdom, service is praise and expected, then in this home, everyone has a role to fill. Everyone has a part that they can play. Everyone can serve. Now, I don't know what goes on in your homes, but good brethren, everyone can serve. Even at a young age, you can walk, you have strength in your arms, you can somewhat understand what I'm saying, you can make your bed every day. You can clean up your toys every day. You're done with the meal, you can take your dish to the dishwasher and you can clean it up today. You can help with the chores around the house because service is expected. You can fold your laundry. In fact, there may come a time you can learn to do the laundry. Heaven forbid, you can do the laundry. I mean, it might take some practice. There's a lot of buttons, but you can do the laundry. I love the little story of a, of a college student who called home. He says, Mom, I'm... I've got an issue. I need help washing the sweater. She goes, well, sweetie, what to say on the sweater? He says, University of Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Row it away. That's a <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No. <laughs> no, you can. Service is expected. So let me ask you something. If the kids never serve at home, are they going to learn to serve when they're out on their own? Haven't you seen it? But the millennials go out on their own, and they don't know how to clean. They don't know how to do the laundry. They don't know how to do the dishes because they never were expected to do it at home. And it's not just that we expect our kids to serve at home. It's a service that extends here. And so when you're at church, when you're with the brethren, the spiritual family, I want you to serve. We're going to take some time as a family, and we're going to serve. I want you to go to someone who's not in your age range, and I want you to be kind. I want you to write them a card. I want you to go sit next to him and tell him that you're thankful for him. It's a service that extends outside the home. Look at the neighbors. You're going to help me serve the neighbors. Or maybe you have a friend that's having a hard time. Let's see what we can do to help someone outside of our home. Because you know what service is doing? You're instilling within them a heart of humility. A heart of looking for the needs of others before my own. You're instilling in them open eyes. The good Samaritan where I see someone in need. And I don't say, well, someone's going to come to that. No, if I can help and if I can serve, I'm going to do it. That's the heart of the kingdom of Christ. And in our home, service is expected. And when it's done, it's praised. That's a good godly home. You are setting your kids up for great success when you start them young and you start them early and you instill in them an expectation of service. Number three, home is a place where honesty and trust bloom. If you're familiar with the TV show host uh, Jimmy Kimmel, you heard of him before. So every year he puts on this challenge around October, and it's called the Halloween Candy Challenge. He he issues this challenge to parents, and he tells them that when your kids come home from gathering all their candy, you 
Just tell them the next morning that you ate all their candy and then videotape their response. And at first, it's kind of funny. There, there are some really kind of funny things that happen with some of the things that kids say. But, but for those of you who are parents and, and who see young kids and you see some of the responses of children, <laughs> it hurts. It's cute in a moment. But do you know why they're crying the way that they are? I mean, in one sense, it's candy and they want candy. <laughs> That's what they expected in the morning. But I think there's something deeper here than just that they, they don't have their candy anymore. There's something that you expect out of mom and dad. I mean, of, of all people that our children will, will, will know at that point in their life, you expect mom and dad to care for you and to care for your things. You expect mom and dad to trust you and that you can trust them and that they have your best interests at mind. And so to, to take a, their stuff, to take their things... And then for them to learn it's just a, a cruel trick. It's just a quick way to destroy something that ties every relationship together, and that is trust. Trust is learning to lean and depend on the character of another person. Trust is built by consistency. Trust is built by honesty, by consistently telling the truth. Relationships, real, deep relationships are glued together by trust. And so we think of the, of the lady, the woman, the honorable woman, the excellent wife in Proverbs 31. It says, an, an excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. You think of that in a marriage relationship, to have that kind of trust. When trust exists in a marriage relationship, there is closeness, there is intimacy, there is openness. There's a, there's a fond familiarity that comes with trust. But when there is no trust, there's suspicion, there's doubt, there's questioning, there's distance between the two. How do we gain trust in a marriage relationship? Here it is, you ready? It's really easy. No secrets. Full and complete openness. Whatever it is you want to know, I'm going to spill it. That means you can have access to everything that I own at any moment in your life. And so you can have complete access to my phone. You know my password, your thumb can unlock my phone right now in this, in this instance because it's on there. My Facebook, you can see everywhere I've been and you can see everyone that I've messaged. My emails, you can read them. My texts, you can see everyone. I hide no secrets from you. Unless you work for the FBI. <laughs> there should be no reason you're hiding your, your conversations, your dealings. In secret from your mate. In fact, sometimes I think we need to just be, be ahead of this and be open. Hey, honey, today a sister in the church texted me. She wanted to have this question about plumbing, and she thought I knew what some kind of answer to her question, so just, she, she texted me today. I just wanted to let you know about it. You know how innocent that is? That's nothing. That's nothing. And yet, what would happen if I didn't tell my wife this woman texted me, and she walked by and saw this text on my phone from this one sister in the church? I can get in front of it by being open and honest and just being completely transparent with my wife. And we can do that. We can do that. No secrets. You know this as well as I do. Trust takes a long time to build. And yet it can be broken in a moment. In a moment. I got some young people here with me tonight. You want to have more freedom at home? You want mom and dad to treat you more like an adult? Guard the trust. Guard the trust. Consistent, honest behavior. Because the one moment you're, a place, you're at a place where you didn't say you were going to be, or the one moment you're hanging out with someone that they said they didn't want you hanging out with, they're going to be on you like, a, I don't know the analogy, like two June bugs on a summer night. I don't know the analogy. They're going to be on you like a tick on the dog. That's it. That's it. You want to be treated like an adult. Well, adults, adults, God's adults, the new man in Christ in Ephesians 4, we don't lie. We speak the truth in love. No white lies, no secrets, no dodging questions. We are open and we're honest and we're guarding the trust. Parents, this comes back to us. If we want our kids to learn about trust, if we want our kids to learn about honesty, it starts at home. Here's what that means from the parent to child relationship. If I say to my kids, if you do good today, you'll be rewarded, and they do good, they had better be rewarded. But on the opposite, it's true. If I say, 
don't do that one more time or you're going to be punished. If they do it again, they had better be punished. Because you know why they're doing it a third time? It's not just because they're rotten kids. You know why they're doing it a third time? They're testing you. They want to see, can I trust in what mom and dad say? Because they said it, they're going to punish me. They said they're going to reward me. So I'm going to do it, and I'm going to see, can I trust in mom and dad? Will they, held, will they hold up to their words? We're trying to teach them that what I say, I mean. My yes is yes, and my no is no. I speak no lies, and I only say the truth. That's God's principles, but we can teach it in the home. In the home. And so a godly home is one where honesty and trust, they're going to bloom. And that relationship will only be glued closer and closer together, the more honest and trustworthy we are with each other. Here's our last one. A godly home, the home that brings a great advantage, is one where love and grace abound. Here's a story of a, of a dad and a son who were estranged. Words were said, things were done, and the two, the two had not seen each other or spoken to each other in a long time. And dad missed him. Dad wanted to try and get together with him, but he didn't know how to get a hold of his son. And so he sent out an ad in the local paper. And Ad said, son, it's been a long time. I know things have been said, but I love you and I miss you. All is forgiven. Just please meet me at the front of this corner of the newspaper stand Saturday at noon. Love, Dad. That Saturday, over 100 young men showed up looking for their dad. Because if there's anything we all want, good brethren, we want to love, and we want to be loved. We want to be loved. You know, we live in a world where, where second chances just, just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in this life. You mess up at a job, and you're fired. You mess up at school, and you're expelled. You mess, out, uh, mess up at the streets, and Larry takes you away. You're just, we live in a, in, a, in a world where you're not given second chances. And even in relationships, for some people, when you mess up, when you break trust, Reconciliation is not an option, but, but for the godly home, for God's home, it ought to be different. You see, in God's home, love should not be dependent upon a person's perfect performance. Can I, can I say that again? In the godly home, love, real genuine love is not determined upon a person's perfect performance, which means I love you in good days and I love you in bad days. I love you when you make me proud, and I love you when you disappoint me, but I love you always. Nothing, nothing you could do could ever cause me to not love you. Not in this home. When we brought our, our first son home, our children are adopted from, from Korea, and our first son, Benjamin, we had brought him home. And I don't know, it was about May, maybe about five months into the year. Uh, we were coming home one Wednesday night from, from services, I just had a question. It just came across my mind. We pulled into the house, and I said, hey, hey, Benjamin, do you like our house? I just didn't know if he liked it or not. I mean, it's not if he said, no, we were going to move. I just hadn't really asked, asked him if he, what he really thought about it. And he said, he said, yes. But I will tell you, I will never forget. I never will. I'll never forget what he said after that. And this little three-year-old voice, he asked, he said, stay with Appa Oma? It's also between Appa and, and Holly Oma, which is Korea for mommy and daddy. He says, stay with Appa Oma. And what he was asking is, can I stay here? Can I be in this family forever? Man, I just bawled. <laughs> I bawled. I said, of course. Of course. You're always my son. And you're always in this family. You're, you're not going anywhere. You're, you're here forever. I mean, brother, if there's anything we communicate at home, in a godly home, it's this. I will always love you, always. No matter who you are or what you do, you, you can never run so far from my love. And if there's ever a place where we need, where we need grace upon grace, if there's ever a place that we, can, that we can know, we can know for certain that there's someone waiting for me, someone thinking for me, someone praying for me, someone, even when I'm not who I ought to be, even when I'm far from where I need to be, someone who's waiting for me to come back home, should it not be home? I mean, you think of that story, that heart-wrenching story that Jesus told about that son who took all of his, of his share of dad's inheritance and ran as far and fast as he could to waste it all on sinful living. 
Let me ask you a question, brethren. You know that story, and I do. When, they, when that young kid got home, what drove him home? Why did he go back home? But when he came to his senses, Jesus said, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I'll get up and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. What is it that led that young man home? It was the love of his father, the goodness of his father. And if my father is this good to slaves, to slaves, well, I'd be far better off being a slave in his home than being abandoned in the pig pen. And so he went. That long walk home. And when his father saw him, he saw him, he felt compassion for him, he ran, he embraced him, and he kissed him. He said everything before he ever spoke a word. I've missed you, and I love you, and I'm so glad you're home. listen for a moment if there's anything we can instill within our homes to our children to each other as mates it's this in a godly home it's this no matter how far you run no matter how deep you plunge no matter how bad it is you can always come home can always come home. Yes, home is a place of rules. Home is a place of expectations. Home is a place where God is honored and his boundaries are kept. But if there's ever a place where you're looking for grace, if there's ever a place where you're wondering, can I ever get a second chance after all that I've done, brethren, should it not be the godly home? You can always, you can always come home. Because if there's anyone who's waiting for you, if there's anyone who's still up praying for you, it's that godly mother and that godly father at home. I will leave you with one thought. One thought, how can we make the most of our homes? How can we make our homes what God intends them to be? The great advantage to those in their home. Here it is. It's really simple. You will love your family the best when you love God the most. That's it. You will love your family the best you can when you love God the most. Because when you love God the most, God's will becomes your will. His word directs your steps. Your unceasing desire is to become more like his son. And like Jesus, we extend grace and mercy. Like Jesus, we are patient with others' faults and their shortcomings. Like Jesus, we make it our aim and our desire under the sun in this life to do all things pleasing to God. You will love your family the best you can when you love God the most. I will be the best husband and the best father. When you will be the best wife and the best mother, you will be the best that you can be when you love God the most. The most. Tonight, when you say a prayer together, just a few simple words. God, give us Christian homes. God, bless our homes. Good brethren, fight for your homes. Fight for them. Work hard for your homes. Love your homes. And I know many of you in your homes. Tonight, thank God for your homes. Thank God for the family that he gave you.
And tonight, if you're not in God's family, if you've not been adopted into his home, you can tonight, tonight. Tonight is that night. Because he gave his son for you. And God wants more than anything for you to become a part of his family. For he to be your father. For you to be his child. And as his child, all forgiven. As his child, his name becomes your name. As his child, his home will become your home. And as his child, his future becomes your future. That's a future of victory. That all can be yours. Can be yours tonight. And so if you've not obeyed the gospel, if you've not started that journey tonight, tonight, turn from your sins, wash them away in baptism, and become adopted into his family. Or if you're here and you're a child of God and you're that prodigal, you're running far from home, tonight, maybe just right here in the pew, you just need to say a prayer to God, turning from your sins and coming back home. But if you need some help for that, if you need someone who will pray for you or help you get back on that right path, this is a good place. And right here's where you need to be. If we can help you right now, let's do it right now as we stand and as we sing.